Hello, my name is Andre, and together with Milan, we'll be talking about L4 Tran. Um, we want to thank the JupyterCon organizers for inviting us. We really appreciate the opportunity. L4 Tran is an interactive LLVM based Fortran compiler for modern architectures. Here is the outline of our talk. Uh, Milan will give a background and motivation why we are doing uh, this in the first place, and he'll talk about our effort for tran-lang.org. And then I'll give a demo about L4 Tran in the Jupyter Notebook, as well as a command line. And then I'll talk about the, in the rest of the talk, about the architecture, the current status, future plans, and conclusions. So I'll hand it over to Milan. Thank you so much, Andre. So I'll start with uh, the background and the current state of Fortran. So Fortran is a powerful, easy to learn language, mainly for high performance computing in science and engineering. Uh, however, it suffers uh, from the lack of modern tooling, uh, things that make your life easier as a Fortran developer, like uh, package, uh, package manager, uh, build system. Things are still pretty tedious and manual uh, for the Fortran developer. Uh, Fortran also has a relatively poor ecosystem of libraries, and that's mainly um, in the context of uh, more modern tools uh, like uh, strong string support, file system uh, operations, uh, various um, algorithms, uh, and so on. Fortran is pretty difficult to run on GPUs and emerging architectures. It's possible we have things like OpenACC and OpenMP to write directives uh, and run portions of our Fortran code on GPUs, but it's still pretty difficult relative to running on conventional CPUs, especially if you compare it to, uh, say, you know, even um, running on parallel uh, on CPUs is much difficult than, than running on GPUs. And also users are disconnected, they're in their own, they tend to be in their own bubbles um, in uh, academic and research lab uh, institutes. There's no, there hasn't been strong and coherent online community and interaction. So as a consequence, many users are uh, reinventing the wheels, writing their own little libraries, uh, which suit their needs, uh, but there's a lot of overlapping functionality, but nothing really becomes mature enough to be uh, useful for the broader community. And as a consequence, user adoption and new Fortran projects are diminishing. So can we fix this and, and how, how to address it? Uh, next slide, please. So to get to a thriving open source Fortran community, we believe we need a rich standard library Fortran doesn't have uh, a real standard library like uh, other popular languages do. It has a set of intrinsic procedures and modules which gives you uh, some basic uh, numerical uh, utilities for I.O. Um, um, to work with some strings, but it's really minimal. And uh, there's no central place, central library where uh, the user will go to and uh, grab the utility that, that they need, like uh, Python standard library or Rust standard library has. Uh, we also need an easy to use fast package manager and build system. Uh, so a package manager allows you to, uh, to package your application or library and, and share with other users and make it easy for them to import it into the library currently. You have to do it by hand. You have to figure out how uh, the make files, CMake lists uh, interact. Many, many libraries have custom build scripts. It's really tedious and painful. And also a build system. Uh, there's no single solution currently that works all around uh, well for Fortran. And we're building these things uh, from scratch and with a fresh start. And we also need a cutting edge, fast open source compiler and interpreter for CPUs, GPUs, and emerging architectures. So interpreter is very important uh, because it allows you to develop um, and prototype your application more rapidly. Uh, it allows for more uh, interactive and exploratory computing data analysis. Uh, and also we don't have um, a compiler that can seamlessly compile to, uh, for, for multiple ar architecture, including CPUs and GPUs. 
And this is uh, where L Fortran uh, will come in that Andre will talk uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. And we also need a modern, beautiful website with learning resources to attract new users, new users and keep them together where they'll feel uh, welcome and inclusive. Uh, uh, this we already um, started and put in place a few months ago, and the community is strongly engaged in, in building it and improving it, especially with regard of uh, tutorials, uh, learning resources, and so on. So to address all the, these issues, uh, emerge the Fortran Lang, which is how we call our uh, online community. Uh, it's pretty young. We started less than a year ago, and there have been... Uh, several dozen contributors uh, to the projects already, across several projects. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussion and interaction going on. Uh, next slide, please. So the key, the key projects or pillars of Fortran Lang are the standard library. Uh, so it covers uh, general purpose uh, utilities, file system interaction, interaction with your operating system, uh, manipulation with strings, uh, statistics, um, and numerical work. So broadly, the scope of the standard library is uh, general purpose and the scope of SciPy. They have a very, very similar scope. Then the Fortran Package Manager, or FPM, which is both a package manager and a build system. Uh, we have uh, an early uh, prototype implementation in, ha in Haskell which allowed us to uh, develop fast and get it sort of to a working state uh, very quickly. Uh, and then we started uh, implementing FPM in Fortran, uh, which allowed the broader community to uh, really actively participate and, and build it. So please check it out. You can already uh, use and play FPM to, to install dependencies, build your application. Uh, and we will aim to uh, uh, allow it to also have multiple backends uh, to allow you to generate make files or uh, or a conda package or a CMake list for if you want to distribute your package to users who don't use FPM. And then also compilers. Uh, there are over a dozen actively developed and maintained Fortran compilers. Uh, a few are open source. Um, uh, other com commercial vendors, and we aim to uh, work with both open source uh, compiler developers and interact with commercial vendors to make them more easily accessible to the broader Fortune community. And you can check out all this uh, at, at the website and, and engaged. And uh, ne next slide, please, Andre. I'll just go into. Um, a little bit more detailed overview of, of the community and its projects. In the upper left, you have STDlib with its, um, with, uh, the kinds of uh, utilities and um, uh, features that are in scope, uh, and most of them already in STDlib, but it's currently uh, actively being developed and evolving. Uh, FPM, which is both package manager and a build system, which will foster a healthy Fortran ecosystem. And then I mentioned compilers, both open source and commercial vendors. And also the online presence, it's much more than just a website. It has tutorials, monthly newsletter, a discourse forum, a mailing list, uh, which you can use to receive news in your email, and a package index, which allows you to um, browse uh, Fortran packages out there. Uh, look, when you need a Fortran library or an application, uh, you can go there to search for it. And it's a pretty strong uh, and comprehensive index already. Uh, so please, after this talk, go ahead and check it out. And now I'll, I will hand it over to Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you, Milan, for this excellent introduction and the motivation of why we do what we do. And now let's uh, talk about L4 turn in particular. So besides what Milan said, um, here is a motivation just for L4 trend. Um, we would like Alphatra to be everything you would expect from a modern compiler. So cross-platform compilation to binaries, interactivity like Python, nice error messages and warnings, um, 
automatic interoperability with other languages. So you can call it from Python right away and so on without having to write wrappers. The compiler knows everything. It should be able to do that for you. Same with C++, Julia, and other languages. It should be able to translate Fortran to other languages, such as C++, Julia, and others. Um, we would like automatic formatting and language server so that uh, Fortran can be used with VS Code. Um, it needs to run on modern architectures, including GPUs, out of the box. Um, it should have a clean design and usable as a library. Uh, it should provide static analysis for Fortran code. And all of that should be facilitated by, by a modern compiler. Uh, let's do a demo. Um, and we'll start with the, um, with the Jupyter uh, notebook demo. And that will give you an immediate idea of what L4 Tron can do. So <clears throat> about a year ago, um, I had a, we had a similar notebook, which was powered by L4 Tron prototype written in Python. And by now, we have written the whole L4 Tron into C++ for production use. And um, we now reach the parity of the Python prototype. So we can do the same notebook, but this time it's powered by the C++ L4 Tron kernel. And you can, um, in fact, see the old notebook um, if you click on that link. And it's just a static version. You can see all of this was executed by a Python-based um, prototype. So now let's do the same thing, but this time it's executed or powered by the C++ L4 Tran. So um, what you see here is um, it looks like Python, but it's um, it's Fortran. So you can use it as a calculator, one plus three, two plus three, and so on. Um, you, you can use it. Um, you can use it with variables, but you have to declare them because it, it's Fortran. You have to declare your variables. Um, you can um, declare a function, and then you can use it. You can use it in expressions. You can declare a function. So when you do that, it shadows the previous declaration, just like in Python. Uh, so in this case, in the first case, it was doing A plus B. Now it's doing A minus B, so you get a different answer, as, as you would expect. Uh, you can use do loops and if statements. You can print things. And they get captured by the kernel, and, and you can see them in the notebook. Um, in the prototype, we had a plotting. Uh, and it was using a magic plot function. Now we are properly designing this so that it scales. Uh, and, and in fact, um, I can show you we have an issue open for it. And the prototype that we are going to use is the one that was developed by Zeus Klink. The idea is that the user will return a custom, custom derived type and then provide a function that can properly format it. And that function will be the same module. And then the kernel will get it from the module and format it. Um, so that it will be not tied to L4Tran in any way. Um, and that way people can then write plotting libraries and so on. It's not done yet, so it's commented out. Um, then the next part is about some internals of the compiler. So you can show the AST, uh, abstract syntax tree. So in this case, it's some kind of a do loop. So you can see this is what the compiler parses it into. And then you can show the LLVM code for, um, let's say, this loop, here it is. And you can also show the assembly code. So all of this works. And so now this, this is roughly reached the parity of the Python prototype. So we are very happy about that. Um, the next thing I want to show is some, some, some new things that uh, the compiler can do. I have another demo notebook here. So we start with the AST, you just saw it. Um, what the C++ implementation of l 4 does is that it, it parses the source code to abstract syntax tree, and then it transforms that AST tree into a representation called ASR, abstract semantic representation. Here is how it looks like. Uh, the AST is strictly based on syntax. Uh, so for example, you can even do something uh, that makes no sense, you know, some variable that's not defined, but it will happily parse into an AST because it doesn't do any kind of semantics. It's just strictly based on syntax. The ASR, on the other hand, figures out all the semantics and checks it and reports all error messages. And if it gives you the ASR back, it means that it's a valid for code and it's ready to be translated, for example, to LLVM. You can see that it has a simple table. 
every variable has a type. Um, every expression has a type. So for example, this is um, the binary operation. You can see it right here. It has a type. Um, right here, it's an integer. And it's an addition. Um, and then this ASR is the representation that is used for all the backends in Fortran. So of course, we have the LLVM backend as the default backend to compile and as well as interactive views. It takes this ASR and then transforms it to LLVM. And it's a single pass transformation. It's a very simple thing to do. You just go over each node in this representation and transform it. And you know the type, you know everything locally, essentially. You can easily look up the types and the symbol table and everything is there. You don't have to, essentially in the backend, you don't have to worry about anything. You just, run, you just generate code. Of course, we saw the assembly. Um, well, Fortran has multiple backends. So another backend is C++. Um, so it can take a function and it can tra it transforms it to ASR first and then to C++. And it's using Cocos as the array implementation. So you can see the do concurrent gets transformed to Cocos parallel four. And so it executes in parallel on GPUs, for example, already today, and multi-core CPUs. Uh, it can translate whole, whole programs. So you can write a program, you can do some arrays and allocate them, or this time it's a static allocation, and uh, initialize them in parallel, as, and then compute with them and print something on standard output. And you can see everything gets uh, properly transformed to C++. And this compiles and then works. Um, and then l Fortran also has um, a formatter, so you can give it any Fortran code. And if you call l Fortran FMT, or in the notebook show FMT, it, uh, it formats it for you. Um, so those are all, all the pieces. And while we are here, we can also show uh, some of the features, uh, other features. So let's say we have the variable i, so we can assign to it, let's say we assign some five to it, and then let's say uh, we can print it. Let's say we assign a string to it. Let's see what happens. So we get an error message. In this case, it's a semantic error. It highlights where the problem is, and it tells you that only integer and real can be assigned to an integer. Um, if you, for example, um, type something that's not even uh, declared, it tells you the variable is not declared. If you provide some input that cannot even be parsed, it will give you a syntax error. In this case, it's the, the parser itself gives you an error. So the error messages look pretty nice and they'll be even better in the future. And this is what we uh, want. Um, and now I think it's time to show some demos from the command line. Let's come here and <clears throat> I'll do. So here I have, um, let's say, some, some simple program. Um, so L Fortran can be used just like any other Fortran compiler. You can just call it and it will compile it to uh, machine code. Uh, in this case, it's using the LLVM backend. It can also um, use the uh, C backend, so you can just change the backend to C++, uh, compile. What it does, it, it, it takes much longer to compile because it generates C++, that's immediate in this case, but then the C++ compiler needs to compile it underneath. Again, uh, we run it, the C++ backend doesn't put spaces in the print statement, it has to be improved, but it's kind of nice to see that it actually works. You get some different output. And then um, we also have another backend I had to modify the code because the backend is a little bit simpler. It's the x86 backend. It generates x86 machine code directly. Uh, and again, in this case, just prints at 25. Um, so, and so that's the command line. We can also do the, um, for example, if you want to format things on the, on the command line, this is how you can do it. And if you want to know some options, you can do dash h. And let's say we want to use, let's say we want to indent inside the, um, you know, the, the, the program. So you can just put some options. You can also change the spaces and so on. So this will become very, very useful. Let's say if you want to use just two spaces. Um, so it will just give you um, two spaces. Um, and 
I think that cover. Oh, I of course I forgot almost. Uh, if you run Elfortran just like that, it gives you the interactive prompt. So you can use it just like the Jupyter Notebook. You can declare some variables. You can use them. You know, you can do arithmetic with them. You can print and so forth. Um, you know, I have history and, <clears throat> and the Elfortran. Here are all the options. It can show you if you want to show the AST, for example. You can just call show AST. If you want to show the ASR, you can do that. You know, all of that from my command line also. Um, and then it has this. We already saw the format subcommand, and also it has a kernel. The kernel that's that's the Jupyter kernel. And so everything is in this single binary, L4 Trump binary. So uh, it's very convenient. Um, now let's get back to the talk. Um, so we dump the demo. Uh, this is the architecture of L4 Trend. It takes the Fortran source code and transforms it to AST abstract syntax tree. And we already saw it, how it looks like. And then the AST gets transformed to ASR, abstract semantic representation. And we also saw how it looks like. And one can also come back, back to AST and back to the source code. And then all the backends of L4 Tran operate on the ASR representation. So we have the LLVM backend, you saw it. We have, you saw the C++ backend. We also have the x86 direct machine code generation. The idea of their backend is to generate machine code as quickly as possible. So for very fast compilation, it's very fast. Um, we also uh, will have a Python backend and Julia backend people requested. We'll do it later. Also, um, open ACC backend. Um, we can also uh, will be able to transform, for example, expressions to SymPy. Um, you know, there'll be many backends. Very, very useful. Um, so, some of the details about the architecture. Uh, we already talked about the AST and ASR. They are all both standalone representations. So once you get, for example, to AST, you don't need to know anything else. You only have to know the AST. The same with ASR. Once you transform to ASR, you don't need any AST or anything else. ASR is a self-contained, it has all the information. And then user tools can target either AST or ASR. So for example, if you are writing a code formatter, AST typically is enough. But if you are writing some transformation to C++, you want to use the ASR because you want to have the types available for you. Uh, ASR, you can think of it as manipulating Fortran code just like SymPy works. Um, SymPy's expressions, the ASR and L4 Fortran manipulates the whole code. So besides expressions, it has statements and some, you know, some modules, modules and so on, subroutines. Um, ASR also allows rewriting and optimizing the code, things like loop transformations and inlining, as well as because it can transform it back to the Fortran code, you can see the, the you'll be able to see the, what, what the compiler actually does below the hood. Very helpful. Um, one can also, we obviously examine the LLVM code, although it's less readable than Fortran. And, um, and so all this architecture makes the compiler more transparent and helpful to the user and allows to write all the tooling on top. So what's the current status? So I mentioned that we have the Python a prototype about a year ago, and since then we have completely rewritten into C++. And what you saw today in the demo, that was all the C++ version. And so by now we have reached and surpassed, in fact, the Python prototype. We are very happy and excited about that. Um, it already works interactively, as you saw. It compiles simple programs um, and has three backends, LLVM, C++, and x86. They all work. I showed you all three of them. It has a very fast compilation, and that comes handy once uh, Fortran is more developed, uh, when compiling large production codes, especially with the x86 backend, it would be very fast to compile, very helpful. That's what I want as a user. Um, and obviously, for product, for release um, compilation, we use LLVM and enable all the optimizations. Um, has a Jupyter notebook kernel, has a code formatter, and then the parser itself can actually parse most of Fortran 2018. Um, also, it's a big milestone. The later stages of the compiler cannot uh, deal with it yet. They, they, they operate on a much smaller subset. But the parser itself can already deal with most Fortran. So if you have some Fortran code and it cannot be parsed, you get a parse error for a valid code, please report a bug and we'll, we'll fix it. Um, 
So the near future plans are we want to get first users and we are very close to do that. Um, we will be able to polish what's in there um, and provide some example notebooks uh, with some code we have to still implement. So the array, 1D arrays work with the C++ backend, but they do not work in LLVM yet, but we will fix it soon. Once we have that, we'll be able to write simple for trunk codes in the notebook and we'll um, hope to get first users. Uh, the next big goal is to parse all of 2018 into AST. So we can the parser can parse it and understand it, but uh, it needs to be put into AST. Not all the information is extracted yet. And then obviously get the AST and ASR working for all of Fortran uh, and make the all, all the backends usable for uh, user score. And down the road, we obviously want to implement all the other um, items from uh, the motivation. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to any feedback that you can give us on Twitter, GitLab, and mailing list. Thank you very much. Thank you.